We are nearly two weeks removed from the Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe v. Wade. And I just can't stop thinking about something one protester said after the Dobbs decision came down. So I received a text message from Joe Biden's campaign yesterday saying that the Supreme Court had overturned Roe versus Wade and that it was my responsibility to then rush $15 to the Democratic National Party. Um, and I thought that was absolutely outrageous because my rights should not be a fundra fundraising point for them um, or a campaigning point. Uh, they have had multiple opportunities to codify Roe into law over the past 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and they haven't done it. And if they're going to keep campaigning on this point, they should actually do something about it. And she's right. Democrats have had chances to codify Roe. So why should anyone believe this version of the Democratic Party will actually get anything done? After all, it's a party being led by President Joe Biden, a man who has opposed abortion rights in the past. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell asked Biden that last week. Your views on abortion have evolved in your public life. Are you the best messenger to carry this forward when Democrats, many of them, many progressives, want you to do more. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm the president of the United States of America. That makes me the best messenger. The bottom line here is, if you care if the polling data is correct and you think this decision by the court was an outrage or a significant mistake, vote. Show up and vote. Vote in the off year and vote, vote, vote. Not exactly an inspiring message of support for abortion rights there. In fact, in his entire response, not once did the president explicitly express support for abortion rights, choosing instead to voice support for privacy rights. And his silence caused Ellie Mistal to call out President Biden in his latest column for The Nation. Ellie writes, quote, Some might argue that 12 days is not enough time to develop a fully fleshed out federal response to the revocation of the right to bodily autonomy for half the population. But I'd point out that it has been 65 days since the Supreme Court's draft opinion and Dobbs was leaked to Politico. Perhaps some people wanted to believe that that decision wasn't real until it was announced, but the federal government should not be extended the luxury of sticking its head in the sand when it has forewarning of impending doom. Joining me now is Ellie Mistal, justice correspondent for The Nation. Ellie, you were the guy that we had to have this conversation with, right? Because in your latest piece, you wrote, when their people are under attack, when the public is suffering, when lives and livelihoods are threatened, great presidents find a way to do something to fight back forgettable presidents find a way to do nothing. Should Americans have the confidence that we need that the Biden administration actually and finally has a plan to deal with the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs? The fact that they haven't had a plan already is a version of executive malpractice. 657 days ago, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. And at that point, that was the starting gun. Everybody who was paying attention, me, you, Katie, we all knew on the day that she passed away that this day was coming, that the day that they overturned Roe v. Wade was coming. That was always part of the plan. And if you don't know, now you know. So for any presidential, Democratic presidential administration to come into office 530 odd days ago without a plan, to counteract the Supreme Court's clear intention of overturning Roe v. Wade was already a mistake, right? So he's had two years almost to figure out what to do, right? Then, as I said in the piece, the Dobbs, the Dobbs decision leaked 64 days ago. I also said in the piece that uh, the Texas SB8, which functionally revoked the right of under Roe v. Wade in Texas last September, it's been 300 days since Texas went full Christo fascist. So the idea that you've only had a couple of weeks to cobble together some kind of federal strategy, just I, I don't accept that. You've had, you've had months, you've had years from a certain perspective to put together a federal response to the revocation of women's rights. And we haven't seen that yet. So, Ellie, we can complain, but you and I, let's be solutions-based, right? So let's deliver solutions and bring them to the table. What specific executive actions could the Biden administration take right now to provide some relief on abortion rights? 
First of all, he should be making abortion services available on federal lands. Federal lands are sovereign from state lands. State laws shouldn't apply to federal lands. Um, and we should uh, be having doctors who are willing to do this. And this is going to be a risk for them. But there will be doctors who are willing to do this, who are willing to pay for them out of their own pocket. That kind of gets around the Hyde Amendment, which, by the way, should also be repealed. Um, and you can provide services there. You can provide services at military installations. The Department of Defense has already said that it will still um, conduct abortion reproductive services for its um, uh, for the military, um, but you could let the military serve uh, civilians on military basis. So those are two very obvious things. Three, um, abortion drugs, right? There are drugs that are available um, in some states, FDA approved, um, that can terminate a pregnancy up to 10 weeks. Those, job, those drugs are not easily available. Those drugs are now illegal in some states. Again, at federal institutions, you should be able to go to your post office at this point and pick up your abortion medication, just like you can go to the CVS and pick up some DayQuil. Like that, again, is a thing Biden can snap his fingers. And people always say, like, Biden can't snap his finger. Biden can snap his fingers and make uh, abortion medication available on federal facilities right now, right? So those are three actions that he can take. Another one, and he's mentioned this, travel, right? Like one of the things that we see red states doing, uh, um, Christian fundamentalist states doing, is talking about restricting the travel options of people who need to leave state to seek abortion services. Biden said that he will stand with people and their right to travel, but he didn't tell us how. He didn't tell us when. He didn't tell us what policy was going to be in place. From my perspective, uh, the federal government under the Department of Transportation should be providing travel vouchers for vacations. I say that every person who is impregnated in this country deserves a free vacation to California on the federal uh, on the federal dime. Biden could do that. There was this story that I think we uh, lots of people saw about this 10-year-old girl in Ohio who was raped and it needed abortion services and couldn't get abortion services in Ohio because of their trigger laws after Dobbs. She had, she and her family had to travel to Indiana, um, whose trigger laws are coming but didn't attach quite as quickly, um, to receive those services. Why does she have to pay for that out of the po pocket? Why wasn't the Biden administration funding the travel for that girl and everybody else who needs to leave these Christian fundamentalist states to go uh, to go to the rest of America where their rights still count. So those are four things right off the top that Biden could do within his own executive authority without having to ask permission from President's mansion and cinema. <laughs> Didn't realize we had a triumvirate of presidents going on here. <laughs> you know, Ellie, public opinion in the Supreme Court is at an all-time low right now. No big shocker to any of us. Now we're seeing new reporting that a religious leader associated with the Liberty Council, which regularly brings cases before the court, was caught on a hot mic saying that they regularly pray with Supreme Court justices. A legal brief from their grief was even cited in the majority decision in the Dobbs case what? I mean, conflict of interest 101? I mean, open the dictionary. There's the exact example. That would be so obvious if this is true. What, if anything, Ellie, can be done to restore confidence in the court? There are crickets from SCOTUS on Clarence Thomas, as well as from Congress. I personally am losing my patience. It's already been worn thin with Ginny Thomas. I'm kind of at my wit's end, Ellie. So what can be done to restore confidence in our Supreme Court? I'm not sure that we should be trying to restore confidence in this corrupt 6-3 um, conservative control court, quite frankly. Like, they, they don't deserve confidence. They are corrupt. They are. And, and we are living basically at this point, Katie, in a justocracy. I think the, the technical political science term is cryptarchy. I don't really understand what that means. It is a we, we are in a situation where laws passed by Congress or orders given by the president to branches of government that the people are allowed to elect don't matter until the Supreme Court weighs in. Our Supreme Court has become overpowered and it's become willing to to basically execute a veto over the other two branches of government. And I like to point out, nobody gets to elect these nine judicial wizards 
who apparently rule over all of us. I don't think that that is a, is, is a good example of a functioning democracy. So I don't think that confidence should be restored in the Supreme Court. I think power should be taken from the Supreme Court. And there are various ways to do that. But unlike the, the, the first part of our conversation where I was talking about executive mm -hmm. actions that Biden can do with a snap of his fingers and, 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 a, and a stroke of his pen, Controlling the Supreme Court really does require Congress and requires a larger majority of people in Congress willing to cut the power out from the, from, from the Supreme Court. So I su support court expansion, obviously, to dilute um, the, the impact of these uh, Christian fundamentalist judge judges. But I also support, and I've supported this for a long time, ethics reform for the Supreme Court. People, a lot of people don't know this. The Supreme Court is the only court in the nation that operates without ethics rules, without statutory ethics rules. Each individual justice gets to decide for, for themselves what ethics are, which is how you get situations like Clarence and Jimmy, Jenny Thomas, which is how you get situations um, with the conservative justices um, fundraising for the Federal Society, and certainly how you get this pray together uh, um, story that's just out now, right? So the way to stop that is with ethics reforms, write down clear statutory rules of what Supreme Court justices are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. That, that takes, an, just like court expansion, that takes an act of Congress. So yes, Biden can do some things um, under his executive authority, but these are temporary fixes. The long-term reform requires Congress and a Congress willing to do something about the Supreme Court. Well, then ironically then, Ellie Mistal, maybe Biden was right in his presser over in NATO, right? Maybe you gotta go and vote to get the people in the Congress that are gonna make those rules and pass those laws that are going to take the power away from SCOTUS. In the meantime, Ellie, perhaps you and I can find the key to the front door. Maybe you and I can find the key to the front door to SCOTUS, conveniently lose it so they don't come back for a next term, maybe. Ellie Mistal, Justice Correspondent for the Nation, thank you for being here, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.